Hello, Tom Lavecchia here with the latest installation of the New Theory Podcast. Today we have a very special guest, as we always do, but I would say this one's even specialer, if that's a word. Scott Capoon, he is a creator, owner, and project lead for Arsenal NFTs. We'll be talking NFTs today. Has over eight years' experience in network engineering and over a de decade in crypto which makes them an OG. So we're going to talk about some really hot topics today. Scott, welcome to the New Theory Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm fantastic, man. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity, brother. Looking to answer any questions you may have, anything crypto related. I'm your guy, bro. Love it. Okay, so we're going to jump right in. Your ahead, first bro. brush with crypto and then your first investment. So you came across crypto however you did. And then what was your first crypto investment? I think my first brush and my first investment are exactly the same, dude. Oh, wow. I found out about Bitcoin back in like 2009. I did a little bit of research on it. And because me as a tech guy, yeah. it was intriguing. It was this whole new decentralized financial system that was not your traditional norm. And it definitely piqued my interest because tech is my thing, dude. I live, eat, sleep, and breathe anything tech. Yeah. So it really captivated me. I read the white paper and I'm Googling this. I just, I bought like, I think I had 12 or 13 Bitcoins at the time for like 200 bucks, dude. Yeah, I'm looking at it. That's when, wait, you bought 12 yeah. Bitcoin for <laughs> 200 bucks. Yeah, two, no, 200 bucks a piece, man. Oh, 200 bucks a piece. It cost you yeah. 400. Pretty much, dude. And then, oh. you know, probably like a year ago. Yeah. Maybe a year and some change ago, dude, they peaked at like 65. And I only had like eight left at that time, but I pretty much off them all. Once we hit the top, I was like, all right, I think. Wait, wait, time out, time out, time out. <laughs> Current value of the 12 is at north of 250, 200,000, right? Whatever it is, 250,000, right? right? But not just that, at peak, you had 600,000 worth. So you unloaded some off at the peak? I, I unloaded some when they were like 60, 65. I think that was like. My last eight that I had, I was like, you know what? I think it's time to, it's time to cash in. Man. That was a half a million dollar score. <laughs> Pretty much, dude. But I've taken that money and I've, I've invested in other altcoins. Uh, there's all sorts of other interesting projects out there, some that aren't so interesting. And, you know, recent events in my crypto career have led me to where we are now, dude. Got it. Okay. So him and I are not far off in age. and. The reason why I bring that up is I am still like an old head right now. Okay. The reason why I didn't jump into crypto. Okay. And I read the white, the same white paper and that's why I have a lot less money. But um, my, my thought process and it hasn't changed is I get the finite um, ecosystem. I get the ledgering. I get the accountability. I love the decentralization and We'll get to big. I would like to discuss Bitcoin first, and then we'll get yeah, into the alt, then we'll get into the alt. Yeah, I'm not sold on the utility. Like I got to be honest with you, I personally believe, and I'm a little bit of conspiracy theorist. I think the black market's pushing it. You and My, me both, dude. I love a yeah. great conspiracy theory, man. I think we're gonna get I along think, just fine, brother. <laughs> I think I think the cartels got rid of the SWIFT numbers and got into. You know, crypto, but that's another discussion. And and the government, which we'll get into, which manipulates it, as we know. We'll get into that in a There's second. There's a lot of like, all, like, all of a sudden, it'll be like, <laughs> what happened to Tom and Scott? Like, you know what I'm saying? But, but we'll get to that. So so my concern initially with crypto. So tell was, the audience, if we disappear, you know what happened, man. <laughs> exactly. Like Elon Musk, if you, you know where we went. So so my the utility for crypto Bitcoin, what was the promise like, you know, when you sold in 09, right? And then where are we now? Because I'm still not sold on the utility. I think more than anything now, just because of the way traditional finances have performed, I think for a lot of millennials and maybe zenials, they recognize Bitcoin as more of a store of value than traditional okay. gold. Like okay. Gold, you have to actually physically own. Correct. It's bulky. You know, you can own a ton of Bitcoin and yeah. store it on a little a little yeah. disc or like, you know, in a QR code with your 12 word seed, a private key, you could pretty much pocket half a million dollars. Yeah. If you had half a million dollars in gold, you're going to need a truck. <laughs> yeah. 
So I, I think, liability that, you know, the usual. Yeah, I think that's one of the selling points for a lot of the, the younger generation that, hey, this is something. And, and in my opinion, dude, it's still in its infancy. It's been around for a while, but okay. I think as time goes on and people see what's happening with traditional finances, I think it kind of offers them an opportunity to save for their future and, and do something more than what standard markets are offering them. Okay. So I want to unpack this a little bit and there's nothing wrong with it. Cause if I give you a green dollar, it's all just belief. Let's call it what it is. I'm back it is. Anything, the right? only reason it's worth anything is because somebody believes it's worth something. Correct. Is that the same premise for Bitcoin or, or cause I'm saying, is that the utility or you think it's a little bit more utility than just that? I think it's a little more than that, dude. I okay. think <sighs> centralized banking mm -hmm. is the, the breadth of it is probably a really in-depth topic that okay. kind of leans a little toward me on the conspiracy side okay. but i think the traditional finance system a lot of people are losing faith in especially the younger generation and i think they're looking for alternate methods to make money and crypto's this big giant that you know has billions of dollars in it yeah. and there's just there's so many avenues you can take with it dude it does there's some learning curve you have to do your due diligence you know, there's this whole other set of circumstances that come with it, dude. Got it. You know, Bitcoin to me, for a lot of people, is like the safe bet. Bitcoin or Ethereum. Yeah. You know, there's millions of coins out there. How do I know where to put my money? A lot of people go with Bitcoin and Ethereum because I'm concerned, not concerned. I'm pretty positive they're a shoe in dude. They're not going anywhere. Well, really, really quick. I don't mean to cut you off, Scott, but that's my point. I feel, and we'll get at the NFTs in a moment. But what I know of it, the NFTs are powered by Ethereum, hence giving it utility. I'm actually more sold on Ethereum than Bitcoin. Is that am I am I right on that, or is that subjective, or, or I mean, am I an idiot? Pretty much everybody's entitled to their opinion, dude. You're going to put money where you feel safe. You know, if you you have a preference for Ethereum for a myriad of reasons, and you know that's completely up to you. If that's where you feel comfortable then that's what you should do, man. I always say, don't listen to the general consensus, dude. <clears throat> There's plenty of people out there telling you, you should do this, you should do that. Go with what makes you comfortable, man. Yeah. Do your own research. If you think Ethereum is better for you because of X, Y, Z, then by all means, dude, put your money there, dude. You know, but okay, now, hold on, hold on. I'm with, I'm with you on that, with you on that. Um, Let's get to the all coins because I, I I don't know if you have that same not energy but that same thought process. I now have an opinion on like, everything, man. Yeah. So give me give me real quick. Give me your success altcoin and give me your biggest failure. Ah, oh, dude, there's so many, bro. Like all coins are pretty much everything that's not Bitcoin, dude. Uh, like I said, dude, my portfolio is pretty diverse. I could yeah. probably name you off quite a few that failed just because of shady things going on in the industry. Uh, developers who had no real intention of doing anything other than scamming people. Yeah, You know, cr crypto is like the wild west, dude. And you really have to watch where you put your money in some of these decentralized finance platforms. Correct. So, you know, I could say uh, at one point, dude, I made a slew on Ethereum and I lost some on Ethereum. You know, I didn't buy into the whole Doge thing, though, man. Oh, my and God. I, my, made, I, I don't say who. A family member got it at two cents. It was at 71 cents. I was yelling at him. I said, if you're such a ow. big shot and you think it's going to go up, sell half. So then, then right. I'm the wrong. I'm an idiot. And then, <laughs> you know, and then, then call me an idiot. But if I'm right, sell half. You at least got a lot of gain. And then if it goes down and you believe in it that much, buy more. What did it do? Went back down to whoever it yeah. went down to. Dude, what goes up must come down, dude. When in doubt, sell out. <laughs> so exactly. Um, all right. So so we kind of you're the crypto guy. You got into the big stuff. You got into the small stuff. And before we kind of graduate um, to NFTs, um, my question to you, Scott, is: Is crypto an asset class that's part of your portfolio or? Is it your portfolio? Because like I get it's, worried. Yeah, it's my portfolio, dude. I, I don't have Yikes. money in anything that's traditional finance, dude. 
Everything that I have is all crypto related. Okay, what's the stupidest thing you bought with crypto money? So you made a few bucks, stupid money. What's the stupidest uh, thing? <laughs> so there was this coin on the Avalanche network called Hamster. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, eh, you know, I'll throw like a thousand bucks on here. I'll see what happens. The premise yeah. was that every time somebody bought, you know, you were paid dividends and, and stable coins. Correct. And I was like, yeah, for fun, let's just see what happens, dude. Yeah. And you know, in a month later, the, the liquidity pool was drained. There was no more funds, and I'm stuck holding like three thousand <laughs> hamster or something. So I was like, "Yeah, I pretty much figured that was." But they happen. paid you in stable coins, or they paid you in an additional hamster coins. Well, here's the thing: like, I got like one or two payments in stable coins. I think my first payment was like seven dollars, and the next yeah. one was like three or four bucks. And then after that, I didn't see a penny, bro. And I was like, "Yikes!" All right, what's going on here? And then I checked the the pool, and the funds were gone, dude. Got it. Well, last question before we get to NFTs. Okay, so um, I have a, a friend and a client, and I, I could probably connect you guys because you talk shop. He does; he's a CPA who specializes in crypto with crypto guys, right? Okay. And he told me some crazy stories of people having, I don't say nine figures, but eight figures in in like coin and going down to a few hundred thousand, like crazy, crazy <laughs> stuff. Did he tell and you about Terra Luna by any chance? Was that one of them? Have, that might have been the one. Uh, so what Luna happened? What happened the there? Biggest, Enlighten everybody. Yeah, Luna was the biggest disaster probably of this year, and I think it was one of the one of the things that premeditated the market meltdown recently. They really? were supposed to be. Yeah, they were supposed to be a stable coin, but they were an algorithmic stable coin, and it was they kept their peg to a dollar by another asset that they had called Luna. I forget what the actual stable coin name was. Yeah, but I'd buy I, at first blush. I'd buy into that if you said, "Hey, listen, you know what? I'm going to buy maybe an altcoin that appears to be a stable coin and it's pegged to a currency." I could see myself getting drawn into that. But see, there's there's a couple stable coins out there, and they all differ how they keep their peg to the dollar. So, for example, Tether is owned by uh, I think the Hong Kong International or something. Okay. They're there. They claim that every tether in circulation is pegged to an actual dollar that they have in reserve. And I know they've been questioned a lot and they don't really undergo audits like a company named Circle does. Correct. Have you ever heard of USDC stablecoin? Uh, no, I haven't. So they're back. They're, they're owned by a company called Circle Financial and Circle Financial undergoes regular audits three or four times a month. To confirm oh, wow. that, yes, you know, we have 100 million stable coins in circulation and it's backed by at least 80% in cash that we have. Got so, it. so it's not over leveraged. Right. And, you know, those are the stable coins that I go with if they're actually backed by fiat. And I feel a little more comfortable utilizing them if they're actually backed by real money. Did you say a fiat, lot. not the car. No, not the car. That's what I refer to as our <laughs> currency. I'll, I'll wait for you. want to laugh. I actually thought of this. I'm like, why don't the big companies create their own currency, like a car company, right? Right. Where you can actually buy the cars with that crypto. So essentially buying it from their own issuance and then rolling it mm -hmm. back into it. And it goes up by, by nature. Like, you get what I'm saying? Like, you I was thinking something here, man. Yeah, I'm I, I, I'm we like, might yeah, have to hook up. I'm like, well, you don't live too far from me. We'll, we'll meet no. after and have some beers. We can chat no, over some beers or Because I think the one thing that you's, you're missing is utility, okay? Now, so let's get the NFTs. Okay, so for those are those, I on, on this podcast, I get a little bit more listeners. So people listening on iTunes, they can't see our beautiful faces. Give us a little bit. Is, let's start from the beginning. What is an NFT? It's a non-fungible token. It's basically... Yeah anything like right now the main focus is on artwork but an nft could be anything it could be a video file it could be a mole mp3 you know yeah. sound video the focus just seems to be on art right now and that's fine but i think it has so many other use cases yeah but an right. nft specifically when it's minted uh when they say it's decentralized you hold it in your wallet you don't you're not actually in possession of it but the blockchain gives you the ability to verify ownership because it's connected to your wallet address. Got so it. you can definitively prove that I didn't steal this. I actually bought this. 
I'm the legitimate o- owner and maybe the only owner. I ha- I have a niece that uh, is a, a IP attorney, and mm-hmm. I believe like after you minted NFT, you could also like offline get the copyright to it as well mm-hmm. like to fortify it so even if god forbid something happens right you still own it like what i'm saying is like it's becoming a whole nother like side industry like I- ips all over it which yep. is i think would be the opposite i think minting it would be enough but it's not i guess people are, are going kind of getting ip attorneys um and, and after they mint the coin also you know filing it with the government or whatever but um okay so so keep it simple well here real quick my nine-year-old i didn't believe in nfts at first okay but then when I had to buy him Robux money, okay, so like <laughs> just just us, us old people. Yeah, I'm familiar with it. My nephews yeah, play gotta, all the time. Man. I got to give him real money to put into the fake universe <laughs> so he could buy a fake hat or skin. Yeah. And yep. as soon as that happened, I said, you know what? There's something here. Okay. So that's a sentence. To me, that's part and parcel part of the NFT type thing. Is that is that a fair assessment? No, I think that's no. just, I don't think those are represented by NFTs. Like, for example, if they were in that particular virtual world yeah, and they bought an NFT and could introduce it to that world and use that NFT in that world to get something, then yeah. Got it. But I mean, now, that's just buying virtual currency that's within that realm to use it to buy other stuff. Got it. Now, like I, for example, I've heard of people buy an nft that's artwork and then get like a digital frame in their house and like put it there they obviously own it for real and then <laughs> i, I heard that, that too, so so just for us lay people the board apes and all that they launched oh. they made money lost money what what's what's like the 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 logan paul type stuff and where, where did it launch and where is it now like the board apes or whatever the heck it was i honestly am so sick of board apes dude okay. i think it's i think it's overhyped okay and there's really yeah, I think they're coming out with some sort of metaverse, so there may be some utility. Okay. But to me, art's a very subjective thing. Okay. Correct, correct, correct. And to me, I, I just I don't see any appeal to the bored apes, dude. I would imagine that anybody that's a lover of actual art would look at those things and say, This is stupid. Why would I actually buy these or utilize them for anything? Correct. I've seen so much stuff on LinkedIn from people who actually make real art and it's pretty impressive and they offer them as NFTs, you know, and they sell for maybe a hundred bucks, 150 bucks, but it's stuff that I would gladly pay a hundred or $150 for because I'm like, dude, that's awesome. I've never seen anything like that in my life. Got it. Got it. The board apes for me, they're junk, dude. Okay. So NFT is a non fungible token. Now, um, all right, I'm going to ask you my specific example, my example. Okay. Yeah, so I um a content creator and I have video, I have audio. Um, and I was thinking of selling episodes and I'm going to keep it as simple. Let's say, let's say we're going to make this episode or an NFT. It's 20 minutes long and I can make it an NFT, correct? This episode? Yeah. Yeah. Anything. You can make video files, MP3s, MP4s, move files. And so there's that- so, so then, so Scott, uh, Scott, give me a second. So, so okay. So we make this an NFT, right? Mm-hmm. My challenge, and maybe I, I should hire you guys, is if that's what you, we'll get to what you guys do in a second. Is I, I, I did mint one NFT, and the gas was like, like three hundred, like, like it was like really expensive. What's gas? How does it work? And mm-hmm. like, yeah. so, let me ask you this: What network were you on? Were you on the Ethereum network? I, I was rareable. So, but you were on the Ethereum network though? Yes, Rarible, Ethereum, and I'd open up a wallet and it was a whole to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, Ethereum right now, I think uh, they're about to undergo some changes. They're about to move to proof of stake instead of proof of work. Okay. The Ethereum network is basically bogged down with transactions, and that's why the gas is so high. So, in layman's terms, gas is pretty much the fee that you pay to either transact or create an NFT. It's a VIG. Wanna, it's a VIG. Uh, it's cool what it is. It's a VIG. It's a what? A VIG. You know, sports gambling, they call it, they charge you a VIG. That's a VIG. Yeah. But I mean, like what happens is those fees actually go out to people like you and I yeah. that are running machines to process all these transactions. Got it. So it's not like it goes to one party in particular those gas fees actually get distributed amongst the people who are supporting the network. And those are the people that are mining, correct? Right. 
Right. So it's not like the creator of Ethereum is like, hey, yeah. thanks for that $10 it costs you to transact. Yeah, correct, correct. It's regular folks like you and I are like, dude, I'm wasting electricity. Pay me something for my correct. efforts. Man. But Scott, my challenge, and maybe it changed, and maybe you could help me offline, is when I went to go create a $300 NFT, it cost me $300 to create it. Well, here's the thing. I would recommend, I haven't been on the Ethereum network for six months okay. just because I'm tired of the high fees, dude. Got it. There's a whole lot of other next gen blockchains that are out there, like Avalanche. That's where I do all my transacting, dude. Okay. The fees are like pennies, bro. You could go on there. Wait, so I can mint an NFT. I could take my library and make each one a video and make them for pennies. For pennies, dude. Pennies. Pennies each, not for the whole collection. Oh, no, 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 no. I got it. I got it. Yeah. Like what you would pay on, I think the highest transaction price that I ever paid on Ethereum to sell something was like. Five hundred and twenty-five dollars, dude. Jesus, I know. So and then, these, where would I sell? Where would I sell said NFTs? Well, okay, so I meant I meant five videos. Now, hey guys, I have these NFTs. I have these videos. They're fans of the show. Don't now. Now, those are are NFTs the same as masters? Meaning they own that video, or they only own that video that's minted? You get what I'm no, saying? No, they only own that particular minted copy of that Got video. It. I mean, the rights to that video is yours because you created it and you have the master copy. Dude. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Hence, that's why people are going offline for IP. I got it. Okay. Right. So, so walk me through this. We, we mint five videos. I go to sell them. Where can I sell them on that? Uh, uh, you know? So you'd have to find a, ne uh, uh, an NFT marketplace on the avalanche network. I'm not, oh, I can't do it on like open seas or whatever. Now, because uh, open sea only runs on Ethereum. Uh, okay. uh, and then they use uh, something called Polygon, which is like a layer two blockchain that's supposed to assist people in getting cheaper fees by paying in Polygon instead of Ethereum. But even that's a pain, dude, because you just want to go there, conduct your business and be done, man. Got it. There's all sorts of hoops, dude. If you minted something on the Avalanche network, the blockchains are not cross compatible, dude. They're not, so right? They're not. You really want to find something. If you mint on Avalanche, you have to find a marketplace on Avalanche to sell. Interesting. Okay. Scott, you know what you're talking about. Tell us a bit about our Arsenal NFT, what you guys do. So let me just preface this by saying one of the reasons this whole thing came about, I've been in decentralized finance since its advent in like 2018. Uh, there's a lot of innovative ideas out there. There's a lot of folks who are doing great things, yeah. but I feel like in the last year, year and a half, things have kind of been stagnant. There's a lot of scams. There's a lot of, there's a lot of BS going on. I lost $80,000 at the start of the year to a Yikes. rug pull, dude. Yikes. Yeah. Which would you might, are you comfortable sharing what it was or no? Arbix finance. I'll be more than happy to tell the world who it was. Yeah. They had a big feature on Yahoo Finance. They did yeah. a big write-up. They had the guy's name. And that was the first time I've ever seen them do a piece specifically on a, a particular DeFi application. Yeah, so I, I thought, oh, you know, that can't be that bad then. Well, I put 80 grand in and five days later, poof. <laughs> so for the, for the lay people, um, so you can get into Yahoo Finance, right? However. Um, it's interesting. I actually was trying to get a crypto article um, on on Yahoo Finance for a client. They're very and, particular, dude. And, uh, they were particular probably because of that. Crypto. So, so, yeah. so what I recommend for the media perspective, um, media sources are um, have a higher barrier to get on them. But take that story and check like Wall Street Journal, check your know, Forbes, check ones that you trust. And then, well, let me ask you this, Scott let's hopefully learn from this. What are some learnings from people that when there's these $80,000 opportunities out there and is it, it is in Yahoo finance, let's say, what are some of the things that they can do to prevent it from happening to them? You know, honestly, like, I don't know if there's anything they can do. If, if they okay. themselves feel like this is promising and they decide to show it, not that they're necessarily promoting it, but they're saying, Hey, this is here. It's really up to, us, the consumer of these products, to go and find their Discord room or their Telegram and Got stop it. in and ask a lot of questions. Dude. Get as specific as you can. Yeah. And if they can answer, 
that's still not an indication that they're going to be honest and upfront, dude, that they're not going to take your money, dude. Got it. You know, and, and a lot of these guys, they're not, they're not doxxed. I'm fully doxxed, which means I'm more than happy to put my face out for this project Got and it. tell people who I am because trust is the foundation for everything, dude. You know, I, I want people to get to know me and who I am and what the platform does. And I'm not only the creator of this project, I'm an investor, dude. I've been out there in the field with everybody. I've lost lots of money, dude. I've made lots of money. Yeah. Like I've seen all the shady things that go on. I've been there long enough to realize what the shortcomings are, what the problems are. And this is kind of why I started this particular platform, dude. I, uh, I, I like that because um, I like that in terms of you know do- doxing, usually you hear dox is a bad thing, but you're actually saying, hey, I'm being transparent. Here's who I am. Here's my track record. And here's here's the rub, right? There should be, don't yell at me, but there should be some either governance or standardization that evens the level of the playing field. But that's the antithesis of the theory of, of um, what is it called? Crypto and NFTs, because you want it decentralized. You're trying to avoid that. So I guess that's when the pitfalls of, hey, we'll keep you decentralized, but you do lose that centralized, I guess, governance. So, yeah, again, so tell us a little bit about Arsenal NFTs. I'm really excited to hear about your company. So, like I said, dude, the whole thing started with all the fiascos that I went through. I realized a lot of the shortcomings, and I was just over it, dude. I'm like, you know what? I think I can do something unique and different. So one of my ideas is, like, when you go to these decentralized platforms – you buy into their native token, whatever it may be, right? Correct. And a lot of these projects, I call it the APY wars because one platform has an interest rate with like 300,000%. The next guy has 500,000. The next guy has a million. I'm going to catch a lot of flack for what I'm about to say to you, but I think it needs needs to be said. And I I don't think a lot of people comprehend the mechanics of this stuff. Yeah. But there's a great deal of, of applications in crypto that are based on pyramid schemes. They're they're Ponzi schemes, man. Like the only reason that they work for the amount of time that they do is because of the sheer amount of money that's put into them. Correct. You know, you got 22, 24, $28 million sitting in a pot. At some point it's going to run out. If you're making 300,000% people are cashing out. Correct. You know, all those things are dependent on new people coming in, feeding the people who have been in there. Correct. And that's not a sustainable business model, dude. It really isn't. Agreed. You know, it's just it's bad economics, is what it boils down. So, is that, so, what does Arsenal do in relation to that? So, the other problem I have is when you join these particular platforms, and this is one Correct. of the problems that my platform aims to solve. Uh, you join, let's say you buy in. You want to make this three hundred thousand percent. You buy in the token at two hundred bucks, right? You're making 300,000%. You're getting paid every 15 minutes. A week later, the market crashes. Now that token's $9. Suppose it never recovers. Now you're making 300,000% just to hopefully make your money back, dude. So you have money now that's stuck and you have no choice but to stay in this platform and hope the dev doesn't run off with your money. And hopefully you can just get out what you put in. Well, investing is that that's a psychological contract. If you buy something for 10 bucks and it goes down to five, you're going to hold on to it. Cause like you're committed at 10. Like, right. Oh, it was once at 10, it can get back to 10. They call that a And that's generally contract. the mentality. Yeah. But again, so my platform isn't based on that. The whole idea is like these platforms amass so much money. Yeah. Like they have them sitting in their treasury. Like one has $180 million. They're Jesus. not doing anything with it. Do you know what you can accomplish with $180 million, dude? Do you know the things that you could build to better the crypto community? Correct. And they just sit there. So, you know, we have a vessel called, I call it the war chest. Yeah. And it's community-based funds that are gathered through our application. And through our application, you receive our native token at a discount. Yeah. The majority of those funds go into the war chest, which is a community basket. And then we have a snapshot.org page where we vote on what of some of the things we want to bring to life. So, you know, let's suppose uh, we have all this community money and we want to build an application. We vote on it. We build that application. 100% of all the revenue 
generated from this application gets converted to stable coins immediately and sent into another contract I have called the spoils of war. And then that, that sits there for 30 days. After the end of the 30 days, there's two airdrops for all token holders. The first airdrop consists of how much of our native token, ANFT, that you're holding. A percentage, whatever your average is over that 30 days. Yeah. You know, suppose you have 10,000 yeah. and you held 25% of the circulating supply for that month. You're going to get an airdrop for $2,500 in stable coins. Interesting. The, sec- the second airdrop. So underneath the ANFT contract, there's two other contracts. There's one is the bonding contract and one is for the liquidity pool. All the profits in stable coins are also going to be allocated for those two contracts, but we can't send stable coins to them. So there's nobody to claim them. Got it. So what we do is take those two contracts, all the stable coins that were allocated for them and then add them together and then divvy them up evenly among every single token holder. So it doesn't matter if you're holding one Arsenal NFT or half an Arsenal NFT. You get whatever get a, portion to your contribution. Right. You're going to get a payout in stable coins regardless. You're going to get two airdrops, one based on your average holding and one split up amongst everybody evenly. Okay. This- just just, just really quick because um, um, I, I believe I get it. And this works. I no, 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 no. I, I get it. But – Stable coins have historically were stable, right? Like there was a, ch- like, you know, for example, this is a Bitcoin, because I'm a lay person, right? It was a channel. I was, it's, uh, it's 25 and 35 grand, and it would stay in that channel. But because you have a bigger delta of like 60K to 21K, doesn't that make the stable coin uh, have a greater variance, making it more difficult? for you to manage a stable coin portion of it. Does that make sense? I and what I'm getting at is you I'm, I'm buying in, right? right. You're, you're 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 messing with not messing with, it's not the right word, but you're <laughs> you're introducing hey, invest here, right? Right. But we're going to back it up and we're going to pay you dividends in like for example, I'm investing in, in foreign currency and you're going to pay me in USD, right? So I'm in. I'm like so it's almost like a win-win. Like let's right. say it craps the bed. At the worst case, I get some or all my You're money. You're still back. getting. Yeah, so I'll, I'll protect. I'm hedging, right? So I'm with right. you on that, right? But but the stable coins have a built a bigger delta or variance than USD. So USD is going to go up to one point zero three ninety seven cents. So I could have a three to six percent delta, right? But versus Bitcoin, which is a, probably the most stable coin out there over the last year has a delta of like 40% or whatever that is. Right. Bitcoin's not a stable coin. Pardon? (laughs) Bitcoin's not a stable coin. Oh, it's not. No. So a stable coin is pretty much anything that's pegged to the U S dollar within a couple Uh, of pennies. Okay. So you answered my question. Got it. Okay. Got it. Sorry. I'm I'm a little soon odd. Got it. Okay. That's okay. No, no, you're fine, dude. But the stable coins, remember I was saying earlier about circle. Yeah. And, And this is one of the reasons that I chose to use USDC as our stable coin because of the history that Circle has, because of the rigorous audits that they undergo three, four times a month. I'm pretty confident that based on how they keep their peg to the dollar, that that stable coin isn't going to fluctuate like Luna. Luna wasn't pegged to anything but its own asset that it created. And if you ask me at some point, that thing was destined to fail, whether it was intentional and he wanted to run off with the money, I don't know, but that guy's under investigation, so we'll leave that at that, man. Got it. So I I get it. You're managing the downside risk, but because of that, is there still significant upside? Well, I mean, there is. I mean, so the general premise is that you hold and you earn. So if nobody's selling and everybody's buying and bonding, the price is going to rise significantly. And as long as everybody holds to get more stable coin at the end of the payouts then hopefully fewer people will be selling because the profits in stable coins, depending on the projects we build, will outweigh them making a couple bucks here and there selling. Okay, because I think the biggest issue, which I believe you're addressing, is, okay, aside for utility, it's you got to hold on to it, right? 
And you're incentivized by holding it onto it, whether you're bonded or not, within the Arsenal NFT. You'll get paid out in stable coin. Right. If it goes correctly, you'll make money off the, your initial investment as well yep. as backed by the stable coin. And then yep. ideally, wow, I start getting some dividends. I'm going to invest more, increasing the value of the token. And that was my other thought too, that people would buy more with those dividends to get more every 30 days. So I'm really, the whole idea is like, like I said before, you buy a particular asset for some of these platforms and you're subject to the market volatility. Here you're not, dude. If you want to sell the token and make money, that's fine. But even if our native token goes to nothing, it doesn't matter. You're still going to make money, dude. It's, it's more of like an IOU or a promissory note that says, hey, based on how much you're holding, you're owed this much stable coin. I love it. All right. Uh, Scott, how can we find you? Uh, you can find me, arsenalnft.org. Uh, you can check all the links on the website. We've been featured in multiple outlets, LA Weekly, Tech Bullion, Bitcoin Insider, the docs. We have a Git book. If you go to the top of the page, you can check all the project details. It spells everything out from A to Z for you. Please check it out. The link for the Discord is also on the homepage. I strongly advise everyone to come in, chat me up. Ask me anything you like. I'm very transparent about the project and what my goals and intentions are. I love it. And Scott, we're going to have you back uh, soon because I want to hear about the uh, progress of your project. And thank you so much uh, for being on the New Theory Podcast. I appreciate your time, man. Thanks again, dude.